Calvary Church. I'm excited to be here today. Come on. Yeah. It's Super Bowl Sunday, man, and you guys probably uh, got plans this afternoon, but you made plans to come to church and to receive. I don't know if you got dragged here or what, but I'm glad that you're here. We're beginning this brand new series called Dating and Marriage. What a spectrum, right? What a spectrum. Dating and marriage. I got the challenge to kind of navigate you through that. Let me tell you kind of who this series is for, especially like who today is for you guys. So today is for any of the students here that are dating or hoping to date, any young people or graduates that are dating or hoping to date, any of the married people that are here today that should still be dating their spouse, like is still for you, or, or maybe people that used to be married but are entering the dating scene again and figuring it out. It ain't like it used to be, and like it's just more complicated now, and weird, and confusing, and all that stuff, man, and getting back into the jungle of dating. This, this, this series is for all of you. I think you're all going to get something out of it. Here's why like, this is important, this topic, because the way that you date actually uh, will either prepare you for marriage or prepare you for divorce. The way that you're doing it. So it's, and oftentimes it's the latter by default. We're preparing ourselves for, for divorce because we're just not entering into the dating phase and season of our life with the right intentions or the right, and I'm, my heart breaks this. This is the reason why I'm doing this series because I care for you so much and I see the hurt and I see the heartbreak and I see the pain that, that people go through. And I'm telling you, culture, like, has one way of dating and, and marriage. And it should be easier now with all the things that we have. We got like dating apps and, and we got compatibility tests and scientific equations. And it seems even harder to find that one. And people are even waiting longer now to like get their life together. And it still is not, it's not any easier. And so my I see the hurt and I see the pain that people go through. Much of our media, much of the songs that you listen to are based upon the pain of heartbreak and stuff like that. And although we can't monetize it like Taylor Swift or Olivia Rodrigo, you can, you can like sympathize and feel because you've been through a lot of the same experiences yourself. And what I've learned is that like nobody cries like the broken heart cry. That cry is in, and it, it's, it's a hard cry. It's, and I've done funerals, and I've seen the cry and the sobbing and the desperation of, of, of the loss of a loved one or someone that is close that is no longer here with us. But that is a different level of heartbreak where, where you're, you, just, you can't be with someone who's actually living. And some things have happened or the way that we treated each other that has, has caused such a rift in families and children and, and like the broken heart. There is no cry. Like the cry of a, of a broken heart. And there's so much pain. There's a lot of pain and hurt. I've talked to a lot of people and done a lot of study and research and talked to people myself leading up to this series. And there is there's so many, like you probably have a lot of stories of hurt and pain through dating. And so the, like the question is like, why do we do it then? Why do we still date if like, man, it just is so hard and it's painful? Here's why. Statistics show that 93 to 96% of people actually want to get married. Like in our current culture, even, even the people who like believe that marriage is like antiquated in a dead institution, they want to get married. So it's like, is marriage dead? Yes. Do you want to get married? Absolutely. Like, even people who say, I don't want to get married, they, like, they'll say, like, but I just, I just want to love somebody and be loved by somebody. And for them to know me and really know me and accept me and all of me, I don't want them to run out on me. I want them to commit to me. And I want, like, thick and thin. I just want to, like, to be with someone. And it's like, okay, you, you want someone who's totally committed, right? Yes. So you want someone who's thick and thin? Yes. For better or worse? Yes. In sickness and health? Oh, I see what you're doing there. So like we might, we might call it something else, but every single person longs for permanence, longs for that companionship with someone who's actually going to step into our life and promise us to never leave. I'm here. I'm here through thick and thin, through the good and bad. I'm going to love you no matter what. Every single person desires that deep down in our hearts. And here's the reality. 
anybody can get a date. And anybody can get married. You just got to lower your standards enough, and you can walk out of here with a date, right? You might be able to walk out of here hitched if you lowered it enough. But, but, a lot don't do this season well, right? They don't do this stage, and there's a lot of regret. And I found that it's based on two factors. A lot of the regret is based on two factors. I'm going to talk to you about today. It's, it's the who do we date and how do we date. The who and the how. The person and the process. Because dating, listen, dating is a process of evaluation. What are you evaluating? A person. You're evaluating a person. And, and you're evaluating if this is the person I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. That is the preparation process. That either you're going into it with that evaluation or you're preparing yourself for divorce. That's it. So dating is supposed to be a preparation process, an evaluation period where you're, ch- you're looking at the, the person. That's the, the who, but then, like, what's the proper way to go about it? From, like, dating to, to marriage, like, what's the proper way to go about that? That's the how. And some people say, well, dating isn't even in the Bible, Pastor, so what are you even going to teach? True, there was a totally different culture back then. They did not have dating back then. There was arranged marriages back then. I'm thankful that that does not exist in our culture today, but that brings new challenges to our culture. And although the Bible does not say dating, the Bible does have a lot to teach us about the evaluation process and about relationship that we can learn a whole lot from. Like, for instance, let me give you a few of them. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 24, it says, Better to live in a corner of the roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. Oh, dude, dude, dude. (laughs) That wasn't your amen spot. That was not your amen spot. <laughs> but here's, 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 this was not, this was not written for the married guy. This isn't the married guy going, oh, now you tell me God, thanks a lot, God. <laughs> this is actually written for you guys as an evaluation, for all you other guys as an evaluation tool. So you look at the word and you look at the woman and you go, okay. Is she angry a lot? Is she always, does she, is she, is she always, do I have to go, what's bothering you, honey? No, no, really, I know something's wrong. No, really, come on. Am I always having to like, does she always got drama with somebody in her life? You better be careful with that girl, son. You don't want to live in that house. That's what, that, that's what that's saying, okay? <laughs> the book of Proverbs has a lot to say about about the right about a godly woman and a godly wife and there's so much ladies later on in proverbs chapter 25 verse 28 it says this like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control in ancient cities the walls were built for security and, and it brought peace if you're dating a guy who's got a temper who explodes or is a bully by the way just because he isn't doing it to you doesn't mean he won't do it to you eventually when there's familiarity If he's doing it to other people, he will do it to you eventually when he builds familiarity. So you need to look like, okay, does he have a temper? Does he explode? Is he he a bully? You do not want to live in a house with that guy. If you bind yourself, here's what the scripture is saying. If you bind yourself with him, he will not build your house up. He will will destroy it. He will destroy your, your home. You'll live all of your days married to a man without peace and without safety, without security. You'll have no walls. Your walls are broken down. You will have no peace and no, you won't feel safe. You'll be walking on eggshells your whole life, trying not to disrupt it, trying not to disrupt or crack anything. Okay, so, so the who and the how. Who do I date? How do I date? I think the Bible does have a lot to say about that, and, and, and we can glean from it as well. Let's start off with the who. The who, the who do I, who do I date? Like, what's, what is that? The, the, the person. One of the biggest problems with the who, though, is this. We tend to look for characteristics, not character. So what are characteristics? It's a list of the features, the qualities, rather than the heart, the value, the belief, the faith, the internal things that are removable and foundational. We look at these external things. So what I mean by that, like, like recently I had to change my, um, the batteries on my smoke detector and it's always annoying. Sometimes that thing just beeps, 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 beeps. But this time I'm like, I'm going to take care of that thing. But I didn't want to go get the ladder out of the garage. I just grabbed the closest thing that was next to me, so which was the stool from the kitchen. So I grabbed that stool from the kitchen, put it under that thing, and I climb up on that. And I stand up on it, and I hear. 
And I get down really slowly on that thing. Now, look, I didn't get off it and go, man, that's a stupid stool. That, no, because that stool was just not meant to handle the weight for which I was using it. So a lot of people put on their relationship, they, they put as the foundation of the relationship the features and the characteristics of a person that they're dating with, the reason why they like them, and then they enter into a relationship with them, and that, that, that relationship was never meant to, to handle the weight. It's a good, it's not a bad feature, it's just not a great foundation. Come on, are you hearing me, somebody, okay? So who, 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 who is separate? The who, I believe, is separated from um, the non-negotiables, because the Bible's very clear on some non-negotiables on the who. And some of you aren't even believers in here today, and I, and I get that. I think you're going to get a lot out of the message today. It's going to help you in your dating process as well. But there, the Bible is clear on a who, and, uh, on the non-negotiables. And then I'm even going to give you some of those negotiables that you should consider and think about, but they are, they are negotiable. Second Corinthians, let me start here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 14 and 15. Here's what the Bible says about this whole season of this dating through marriage. It says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. We'll talk about that in a minute. For what do, what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between, between Christ and Belial? Or, or, and that's just a false god, or just a, an idol, some other thing other than God, Right? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Okay? And the answer is like not, nothing when it comes down to the core essential things, the things that are actually most valuable. Nothing, really. So, so let me give you the three non-negotiables of dating, of the who of dating. Number one, it, it, the Bible is clear. It needs to be someone who is a believer. And I understand, again, some of you ain't believers in here, but I think you can still take a lot away from this point. The Bible says if you're a believer in Christ, it should be someone who is, in, uh, who is a, a believer because this is an issue of allegiance and direction. Who, where, where is their allegiance and what direction is their life going? And Paul in 2 Corinthians used this term of unequally yoked. And a yoke in that is a farming term that you would put, a, put like a, a, these, these wooden you know, heavy instruments on two animals, usually two ox, as they would plow a field. And he's saying, look, you cannot be, un you can't unequally yoke something. You wouldn't put a yoke on an ox and a donkey because they're two different animals. They move at two different speeds. They have two different goals, what they were even created for. And so they're going to be unequally yoked. And so Paul is saying, look, does it, you, that's the same in your, in your relationship. Now, does that mean that you cannot have relationship, any relationship with unbelievers? No. You can have a relationship with unbelievers here. You can eat with them. You can have fellowship with them. You can have them over your house and watch a game. That's absolutely fine. But at the core relationship, when you're trying to find compatibility, there needs to be like an alignment of allegiance and direction in the most important commitment of your life. Some of you have seen people that get together, or maybe you've experienced, experienced this, where you yoke together, meaning you enter into some sort of relationship where one's a believer and one's a not, not a believer. And you've probably seen that or experienced that, and if you haven't, let me spare you from that and explain to you what that does. Because you guys might be able to get along when you're watching the baseball game. But when it comes to the core decisions of life, like decisions of like, how are we going to spend our money and how are we going to raise our, our kids and what values are we going to live by? One of what's going to happen that you see is there's a compromise that's going to, if they're yoked together, picture them tied together, them literally tied together. And one person say like, what's going to happen is this one of two things. The, the believer is going to be pulling on the unbeliever, dragging them to church. Like some of you got dragged to church. You don't want to be here, but like, uh, someone's like dragging you to, to the stuff and like, you because because you're you don't want and so it's just it's tension on the relationship or or this person is is causing a compromise of the conviction and the core values of a believer and pulling them the other direction in any case though there is tension that is caused in the directions we are going and there is like you see it in the strain of their relationship, of how they communicate, and how they relate and eventually what happens is they feel the tension so long and they go this isn't worth it this isn't worth it. We're just two different people now. We just we just grown apart. We just want two different things, and they eventually separate. That's what ends up happening. And and listen, I I believe like you need in the in the core things. I don't care like there, you're gonna have some differences, right? 
She likes Pilates, you like tennis. That don't matter, whatever, okay? There's going to be some differences, but, but in the core, most important value, belief things, like there needs to be perfect alignment. Like you want to line up, like, like I believe in God the Father who sent God the Son as a substitutionary sacrifice for the forgiveness of my sins so that I'd be indwelled by the Holy Spirit and be empowered to live a righteous life and serve people and love people and change the world. You don't want to compromise on that. You want there to be some alignment on that stuff. And I'm telling you, the loneliness of being single is better than the loneliness of being unequally yoked. Because there's, there's a loneliness of sleeping in a king-sized bed next to a person that you cannot connect to or communicate with on the most important things in your life. That is, that is, that is you need someone, the who in dating. Number one is someone who is going to be a believer. Number two, it's someone who's not just a believer, but they need to be pursuing Christ. I am, I am not impressed with someone who calls himself a Christian, especially in our culture. Everybody thinks they're a Christian. 80% of people think they're a Christian. You, want, you really want to know if they're a believer or not? Here, look, three things. You look at three things. You look at their Bible, look at their church, look at their friends. Uh, okay, that's how I'm going to assess if I was you in this dating period, you're looking at who, I'm going to look at that Bible. If they don't got a Bible, pff, they don't got a Bible, get out of here. What are we doing? What are we doing? Okay? If they don't have a church, or if you go to church with them and everyone's like, who are you? Or if they're, or if they're like, where you been the last year? You're like, okay, okay, okay. Or, or look at their friends. If all their friends, look, that's who he is. He's going to be who he hangs out with. So you want to look at that. Because anyone, anyone can call himself a Christian. Hitler said he was a Christian. But that ain't impressing me with nothing. It ain't be someone who's actually pursuing God. Because that's, isn't that what you want? Those of you that believe in God, don't you want that? Don't you want someone who's actually pursuing Jesus with their life? Ladies, you want, you want this. You want a Psalm 1, 1 kind of guy who blesses the one who does not walk in a step with all those idiots in the world, man. With the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or take a sit, sit, sit in the seat of mockers. You don't want that. You want someone who loves the word of God and who meditates on it day and night. And he's like a tree planted by the streams of water and everything he does prospers and his, his leaves do not wither. That's what you want. You want a man who's like, okay, some character qualities inside of him. And ladies, you want like a Proverbs 30, or men, you want like this, a, a woman like this, a Proverbs 31 woman. This is a big chapter about it, but here's a little bit. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She, you don't, you want that. Now look, for some of you are like, this ain't even me, man. I ain't even... Hold on, we'll go there. Okay, I'll go there with you in a moment. But this is, just, just hang, don't evaluate. Don't, don't, get, don't push back on me while I'm teaching you until the very end, okay? Just go on a journey with me as we study the who and the how before you start canceling stuff. Oh, no, no, cuz, 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 okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11 says this. But now I'm writing, this is the Apostle Paul writing to the church. But now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who actually makes a claim to be a Christian, to be like a brother or a sister but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or slander, a drunkard or swindler. He says, don't even eat with such people. So like, so there is a, there is a measure of community that you can have with someone who, is, who is, doesn't know Jesus. Absolutely, you can't put the standards of the Bible on someone who doesn't even believe in the Bible. But, but the Apostle Paul goes, no, but if there is someone who knows the standard of the Bible and says they believe in the standard of the Bible, but in their money, in their sex, and in, their, in these areas, of their, in their words, it's not aligned under the Lordship of Jesus. you got to stay away from that person. Not only are they not date, dating material, ladies and men, but they're not even people that should be in that inner circle of your life. They shouldn't be that, okay? So, so it's, it's someone who is going to be a believer. Yes, that's my who. They're going to believe in God. But they're also pursuing Jesus with their life. And then number three, it's someone who is actually running at the same pace as you. Don't do the whole missionary dating thing, please, please. Like, like you know what I'm talking about, missionary dating, it's where you're, like, you're on a mission to save him while you're dating him. Missionary dating. So it's, it's like, he's such a good guy. If I could just get him to come to church, Pastor, could you, could you meet him? Could you help me? I'm going to get him to come to church. I'm like, you're in trouble, girl. You're in trouble. Like, like, 
well, he's a believer, but no, no, no. Look, the person that you're, in, you're going to enter life with is either going to double your effectiveness or cut it in half. And what are, so what is this person actually doing? Are, you, are, you, are they going to cut you in half or are they going to double? You want to run with someone who makes you play your best game. That's who you want. Okay, now look, those are, those are like non-negotiables, you guys. As you're looking at your who, all right, and, and there's probably billions of the opposite sex in the world, but I just narrowed it down by millions for you, okay, <laughs> millions for you, okay. But then there are some, there are some like n- negotiable ones that, that I think you should consider. And it might be more important to you than others, but these are the, the negotiable. Let me get you three of them. Here's number four. Is, is are you theologically compatible? That's a question you kind of want to, are we theologically? Now, in those core theological principles, like I believe there should be alignment, but there are some, theolo- there's like, like, and that's just up to you. This is the negotiable. Like, like for some of you, it's negotiable, like Protestant, Catholic, Pentecostal church, Baptist church, like what, what are we going to do? For some of you, that's more negotiable than others, but that's like, you just got to figure that out. Like, uh, you, 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 you got to line up on the big things, but some of those theological things are just, they're a little bit more negotiable. You should ask the question, are we theologically compatible? Number five, you want to ask this question, are you directionally compatible? So, meaning this, do you want to end up where they are going? Okay, where are they, where's their life going? Now, don't confuse intention with direction, okay? It's the direction of your life that determines the outcome, not the intentions of your life. So be careful that you don't look at someone's intentions and go, oh, that sounds good. No, no, no. Look at where their life is pointing. Directional compatibility. Where are they going and do you want to be there? They might want to be in a different country, per se. Do you want to be in that country? This is just, these are just negotiable. Is that okay? Maybe it's not a different country. Maybe it's just like a demanding career. Maybe they've got a demanding career that they're going towards, and it's going to take a lot of support, maybe even sacrifice as a spouse of this person for at least 10, 15 years. you gotta, you got to support this thing, man. He wants to go to the military. He wants, or whatever that is. You know, you just got to, are we directionally compatible? And then number six, which a lot of people lift up way too high, is are you physically attractive? Are you physically attractive? Which is important, I mean, it's, but it's one of those non-negotiables. It's one of those things. Can I tell you, you young people that are in the dating scene, and look, sex is fun. God, made, God, God invented sex. He is so cool, dude. Sex is a whole lot of fun, okay? But, but sex is, is not what married people do all the time. That might be a misconception <laughs> that you are thinking about. It's not. It just isn't, okay? So it's going to be like when you do it, it's the best thing you're going to do that day for sure. But, but, but it's not, it's not like we're just, that's not the, honestly, what we're doing most of the time is just hanging out, just doing stuff together, life and errands and stuff. So, so a big question when you're dating is, do I like hanging out with them? That's the big question. I see so many people who stay in a relationship because they're so hot. Ooh. And it's like we get together, and it's like, it's like a bug zapper. We're just electric. And it's so passionate. And it's like, but you see him alone. I see him alone, like, without the whole, you know, sexual stuff. And he annoys the crud out of her. And she bothers him. And when the lure of sexual intimacy and attraction wears off, they are going to get to a place where they figure out, I just don't like you. I just don't like you. hanging out with you, which is why it's dangerous to inject sex in the dating process because it throws off the evaluation. It throws it off. Because what it should be is, is, do I like hanging out with this person? Do I enjoy their company? Like when we go on a road trip, am I praying to get out of this car immediately? Or am I thinking, or does the time fly off, fly by, and I don't even know where the time went? That's what you're looking for here, not just the physical attraction. Here's the problem with this, though, because all of us in our culture have been influenced. Beauty and desire has been influenced by media so much. And so physical attraction has more to do with what the media and what the images and the pornography and the movies and, the, and all these, these romantic co- things that, that the boy gets a girl, the girl gets a boy, and they don't show anything after. Like they just end at, oh, it's happily ever after, bull. Okay, there's, there's all this stuff, man. 
So, and, and so we build our life based on this, the influence of media and all these characteristics and qualities and stuff like that instead of like the character stuff. Like, like try this. Try asking a person, a boy or a girl, like when it comes to what they want, what kind of, what kind of guy are you looking for? Try it and just see what they, they come up with. You know, I don't know. I want a guy who's tall, you know, tall, but not like freakish tall, just taller than me, kind of tall. And, and, and I want him to be strong, but not bulky strong, just fit strong. And I want him to have abs. He's got to have abs. But I don't want to be in the gym all the time. I want it to be more like a natural abs, like that's a thing. More like a natural fit, you know. And I want him to be like, I want to be fit, but I want him to be like into himself fit. So, so you know what? I want him like a Zac Efron body, but not Zac Efron into himself, you know what I mean? And then, and then like I want him to be like, like funny. Like he's got to be able to make me laugh, but I don't want him to be like, oh, he's a jokester kind of thing. He's got to be serious and be able to have a deep conversation with me. So, so, so I, you know, I want to be like fun and funny like Ryan Reynolds, but not dirty, nasty Ryan Reynolds, you know what I mean? So... And it's just like, and I want the jawline, the, you know, like, like Gosling. I want like Gosling, like, they want to look like Gosling. It's like no one can meet the standard that you're creating, not even the people that you're using. Because it's, and guys, you do it too. You're just a lot more shallow. You're so I want a chest like Kardashian and a butt like a gymnast. And that's it. And good luck. Good luck with that. You ain't going to find it nowhere. It's just like it's an assembly line, right? It's like we're at Subway. I'll take the abs and the education, leave the sarcasm. I don't want sarcasm. So let me show you, let me show you like media, how it's influenced. That isn't even like, honestly, it even is real. In the cover of Vogue, Lady Gaga was on the cover of Vogue, and they actually released and found pictures of the actual photo shoot and then the, the edited photo shoot. So the people that you're idolizing, that you're consuming images and, and even like the pornography and the images and the media and the movies, they don't even live up to the standard that you're seeing and that is being portrayed. You're fantasizing over someone that has been chemically, surgically, or digitally enhanced. And when you gorge yourself on all this media, it is unfair to create that expectation that no one in the entire world can live up to. It's unfair to you. It's unfair to everybody for you to put that. And we're basing our foundation of our relationship on things that don't last. They're not bad features. It's just a bad foundation. It's not bad features. It's just not a good foundation. How about you, you ladies? How about this one? Iggy Pop was in the 70s. I don't know if you remember so, I mean, this is a, a 70s rock star. He was the icon of sexuality for men. And still today, this is a guy that ladies would be like, yeah, some of you are like, I don't think so. But, <laughs> like, this is like, this is hot. You know what I mean? This is 70s hot. He was, he, was, he was the thing, okay? But then Iggy Pop today is a different version <laughs> of that. Yeah. Don't look away. Don't look at it. Look at it. Drink it in, ladies. This is what you signed up for. Take it away, take it away, take it away. I'm sorry. I am so sorry that I had to do that to you. But, but looks fade. Charm fades. Here's the reality. You don't want someone marrying you for those things, do you? You don't, want marry, you don't want someone marrying you or being in a relationship with you based on those things that are shallow. You want something more enduring because you're always going to have an insecurity about your looks, yourself. What happens when I get old? What happens if I get an accident? What happens if I get a scar on my face? What happens if I, if I get cancer? I want someone who's actually going to love me for something that's more enduring, not some external things that are chemically, surgically, or even digitally enhanced. And it causes us, I'm telling you, this media has caused us to consume, and we treat, we treat people like, con, like products. We're consuming them. So I don't want your, I, don't, I, I, don't, I just want your body, not, and I don't want your soul, your mind, your heart. I don't want none of that stuff. Just give me your body. Because that's what we can have through the, the way of the media. We can just have body without soul, without mind, without hardship, without difficulty, without challenges. Okay? But, but look, you don't want people to treat you like that because you're not an assembly of features. You're a person. You're a person, not an assembly of features. So, so who, who do we date? Like, yeah, physical attraction is, it's on there. It's a negotiable thing, though, that maybe has been influenced way too much by the media than you realize. The Bible is very clear. Who? 
This is where regrets come from. This is where the challenges come from. I hope I'm helping you out today, the who, but also the how. What's the, what's the how now? Like, like the, the journey of, of dating. Because very different. Biblical times to today. Very, very different times. So how can we get, like, like not only was it arranged marriages, but even like the first marriage in union you know, with Adam and, and Eve, it just don't work like that anymore. Go, Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Let's go back to the very beginning and just kind of, now the Lord God said, it's not good. The first time he said it's not good. Everything else was, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. And then this time he says, look, actually this part's not good or beneficial for man to be alone. He will make, I will make a hel- him a helper, one who balances him, a counterpart who is suitable and complementary to him. God said it's not good that man should be alone. It's a good thing. Guys, ladies, that you desire companionship. That's, that's like, like you want to be united with a partner. Adam had a longing for a suitable companion, and he felt alone. And then God gives him these animals, and, and Adam's like, well, this is cool and all. I love hanging out with the raccoons and stuff, but I feel like there's still, there's still something missing in my life. And then Eve comes along, and he says, at last. A compatible, su- suitable partner for me that we can go on this journey that God has created for us together as beneficial partners together. We can complement each other. And the question is, like, how do we do that well? Because it's more complicated in our culture. Like, for Adam, God knocked him out. He brought a naked woman and woke him up. And it's like, and then Adam broke into poetry. And it's like, it worked out really well for him. That was great. But it just, don't, it just doesn't work out that way for us, right? And there definitely isn't like arranged marriages in our culture. So what, it's, very, it's a lot more complicated. Swipe right, swipe right. You know, looks and charm, looks and charm. Looks, it's all we're looking for. And is that, really the, the, is that really what is best to look for the who and the, how, is that how, what they've created, what media has created for us and the different apps and equations? Is that really, and I'm not going to, like there's a lot I could say about it, but that, like whatever you use, I think there is a, how there is a journey process that I think can can help you. David Books is a columnist with the New York Times, and he said this: that young people today hit puberty around 13. They don't get married until past 30. So it's two decades of coupling and uncoupling, hooking up, shopping around. And this period of life isn't just a transition anymore, it's a sprawling life stage. And he says, no one knows the rules. It's just this sprawling life stage of two decades of, of figuring it out, and no one knows the rules. But I think that it's, it's, a, it's tragedy because the Bible, I think, does give us some wisdom, some guidelines, and yes, a different culture, but those principles can be applied to our lives today. So let me give you a few of them for those of you that want to date well. The who is important, but the how is equally important. Here it is. Number one, I want you to date prayerfully. I want to encourage you to date prayerfully, meaning what? What does that mean? Well, that's, that's inviting God into the equation. That's what that is. Like, don't date. Like, don't date. It's not all on you. Romans chapter 8, 28 says this. And we know that in all things, God works for the good for those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. 1 Peter chapter 5 says this. Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. The apostle John would say that there's no fear in love, because perfect love drives out all fear. You know what's happening in all those verses? For many of us, we enter the horizontal relationship like it's all on us. Like it's all on me to impress you. It's all on me to like, to like make you happy or for, to keep you interested in me. And it's a big burden. i got to keep this person interested in me. And we go in with a lot of anxiety and we got to work at it and, and, and in order to like, like get your attention. But here's the reality. Confidence in God takes the desperation out of dating. So for when you have God confidence, when you invite God into the equation of this stage of your life, when you do it prayerfully, then there's, a, there's, a, there's those of us who know, like who are called according to God's purpose, we know God is working all things for good, that my steps are ordered by God, that I can cast my anxieties on him, that this love that he has given me can cast out all fear, that like, like with God in the equation, I don't have to be desperate anymore. I know that he's guiding my steps. And it doesn't free you from making decisions, but it should free you up to make some good ones. So you don't have the pressure of the relationship to try to impress or conform or do, but to actually trust God with that. Now I can make decisions that are based on trying to get you. I can make decisions on just trying to please God. So date 
prayerfully, the longest chapter in the Bible is actually Genesis chapter 24. I didn't have room to include it or possibly even time to even talk about it today, but I'm going there anyway. Genesis chapter 24. It's a Abraham is, is trying to find a suitable partner for Isaac, but he's living in a land that has not been his inheritance yet, but God promised him the inheritance and a legacy of children. And so he tells his servant, hey, go back to the motherland. I need you to, don't, don't, we don't want to spouse from this land, these people who don't know God, go back to where I came from, get someone who knows God, fears God, loves God, go, go over there, get someone. And this servant was really afraid. He was like, oh my gosh, what if I can't find it? What if, and, he, and there was the desperation, the fear, and the whole dating, trying to find a companion thing. And Abraham tells him, listen, it was the Lord God who called me out of my homeland and told me he was going to give me this land. He told me he was going to give me a legacy. He told, so if you can't find somebody, you're released from this oath, but do not bring anyone from this land to my son. And so, so look, it may not work out, but I, tr like, I trust God. It may, not look like, it may not work out the way I think it's going to work out, but you're not going to compromise and, and find someone who is not God's will. You, you're just released from the oath. Because so, you know why? Because I don't have to worry about it because God's in the equation. God's, he promised me. He promised me, and he is faithful, and he orders my steps. So, so we need to, it's like, you know, Ruth is, is, is in the field picking you know the story of Ruth and stuff. She's out there in the field. She's picking. She doesn't have to worry about her and, 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 and uh, you know, she didn't have to worry about, like, finding a, a partner, although she really needed one. She really did. You know, she, she's, she's, but she's not worrying. Because you know what? God's order, order my steps. She's not like, here comes Boaz. Okay, I'm just picking up some grain. <laughs> she's not trying to worry. She ain't stressed about it. She's just being an honorable woman, trusting God, like, no, God, God's got me. Amen, somebody? Y'all with me? Okay. Number two, date prayerfully. Number two, date with clarity. Date with clarity. What do I mean by that? One of the greatest stresses in modern dating is, I don't know what this is. <laughs> what is this even? Like, what, what, what is this? Because, because the lack of clarity produces anxiety in relationship. So to be unclear is to be unkind. What do I mean by that? Listen, guys, guys, I'm talking to you. Guys, look up here. Guys, listen to me. Listen, listen. Ask girls out on dates. Ask them out on dates. All the statistics. I did, I did research on my own, like in, in our own community, in our own. And 95% and, and of ladies want you to ask them out on a date. What they don't want. I want to encourage you to stop, stop asking ladies to hang out. Stop asking ladies to go get a bite to eat sometime. Be clear and honorable about your intention. Be clear. It's okay. Like, I know it's like, I don't want to like commit to this thing. No, you're not. It's just, it's clarity of, of, I'm just looking to see. This is a process of evaluation. And it's clear for her. It's clear for you. Ask them out on a date. Okay? Ladies, stop accepting invitations to go hang out. Stop it. It's just, the way that you begin a relationship will determine how that relationship goes and ends. So stop it. Hold on, just, and, and if they ask you to do that, just ask them back. Hey, is this a date? That's okay. Hey, is this a date? If they say no, then you know. Like, okay. It's, at least it's clear, right? It's clear. There is clarity, and it just removes the anxiety of the ambiguity of our culture. Ephesians chapter 4, verse, verse 15 tells us this, that we should speak the truth in love. Like, I'm not going to be unclear. I'm not going to be ambiguous. I'm not going to just lead you on. I'm not going to. I'm going to be very clear about my intention. I'm going to be truthful. And, and when we do that, he says, man, we're going to grow and become every, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head. That is Christ. So I'm not only going to speak the truth in love, but I believe I take it a step further. Truth is love. And so I'm not going to be unclear to you. I'm going to be honorable. I'm going to, I'm going to let you know the intention right off the bat. I'm going to date with Clarity, guys, ladies, make it clear. And it's, does it sound weird that your pastor is telling you to date? You, you, look, it's okay to date if you're following the right guidelines, if you're using it as a preparation for marriage, not a preparation for divorce. And I'm just trying to help you out through the crazy jungle of the season from dating to marriage. And I just think there's some biblical, yes, I think dating is important as a process of evaluation. Absolutely. So do it with clarity. Do it prayerfully. And do it with clarity. And number three, date with purity. Date with purity. There was a case study I read in one book. There was this woman who was interviewed about sex in the city and relationships. And there's a lot of research in this, in this book. And she was in an interview. 
and, and the guy asked her, like, like, what is your ideal guy that you're looking for? Because she had a lot of relationships. She was in her early 30s. And, um, like, he asked, like, right away when you know, like, it's, do you just start sleeping with guy, like, with, with your ideal guy? And she said, she said, no, actually, I don't, I don't. Like, I, she said she holds off on sex if, she, if, it's a, if it's a prospect, but has sex with people quickly if it's just for fun. And, and so she, and, and he asked her, like, why? And this is not a Christian book. This is just research about sex in the city and relationship as young adults and this stage of life that has now just become a no rules jungle. And, and she said, well, and this one is not a Christian, does not even, you know, at least wasn't injecting the Bible at all into it. But she said, no, he said, why? Why do you hold off on a good prospect of having sex? She said, because sex complicates things. Sex complicates it. Um, it complicates really me figuring out if it is. And if I find out that he's not, then I'll have sex. Okay, like, which, which seems kind of backwards to, to some of us. But even, uh, here's what I wanna, want you to know is like, even people who don't know Christ understand this truth, that sex outside of marriage doesn't make your life better. It makes your life more complicated. That's what it does. It just makes it more complicated. What? It throws off the evaluation process of if this person is the one for me. First Thessalonians chapter 4 tells us this, that God wants you to actually live a pure life. Now, I'm not giving you purity rings or anything like that today. Don't freak out on me and stuff. I'm just saying, like, if it, there is a process for dating that I think is better than what the media is peddling you or what other people is showing you, like the, just the custom and, and traditions of this world. I think that although the Bible doesn't talk about dating specifically, I think that God would have a lot to say. I think he would want you to date prayerfully, date with clarity, and I believe by the scriptures, that he wants you to have some purity in your relationships as well, to keep yourself from sexual promiscuity, to learn to appreciate and give dignity to your own body, like, like have value on yourself and on, on what you are giving and entering into people, not abusing it, as, so, as is so common among those who know nothing about God, but you know about God, and you know it's better. You know his way is better. So we're going we're gonna to date with with some, some clarity, man. We're going to date prayerfully. We're going to date with purity. Number four, we need to date in community. What I found as, a, as, as I think a, a lot in relationships, when people start dating, they enter into like isolation far too quickly. I think you've known some people or been the person that once they, like once your friend finds somebody, they disappear. Like where'd they go? Oh, they found a girlfriend. Oh, man. This, they found a boyfriend. And they just like, and they go they too quickly. Listen, in, in dating, I believe, listen, there's got to be a, a certain level of autonomy where I don't become so quickly codependent upon the other person and attach myself so quickly to them and detach myself from my community for a lot of reasons. One would be that, that in order to live an integral life and to not only know them but you be known, they need to be a part of your life. So I'm talking about your family life. Like, like, like take them around your family at some point. Don't Take them to your spiritual community. Take them to your group. Take them around your friends. Like exist together in those spaces as part of the evaluation process to see how they relate in the social community that is you. Not in the isolated community that is you, but in the social community that is you. And that, and that is not only wise, I think, to, in evaluation to, for you to see that, but it's wise for you to receive it from the people you trust. You put them around them, and you got rose-colored glasses sometimes, and they go, what are you thinking? Do you not see? Do you not see what's wrong with you? And it, you need that. Proverbs eleven fourteen 14 says this, for lack of guidance, a nation falls. But victory is won when I can get the right people around me giving advice. That's how victory is won, man. If I want a victory in my relationships, victory in my dating, my future marriage, I need to get the right people, the trusted people in the environment to see things that I'm not seeing. And I'm open to that advice and I'm asking that advice. Hey, what do you think? And how do you feel? You're going to date in community if you're going to date well. That's the how. It's part of the how. I see that people just do not do well. Galatians chapter 6 says this, carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Like, you don't need to carry the weight of the expectation of that relationship on your own. It's not yours to carry. There needs to be autonomy. Just evaluate and bring other people into the evaluation experience and date in community. Number five, and don't check out on me because i got a few more things that's not in your notes. Number five, date patiently. 
So like, I trust the Lord, okay? I'm, I'm going to believe he's carrying, me, he's carrying my life forward. I don't have to worry. What I mean by date patiently is not that you let the relationship just languish for years and years and years and years, like that kind of patiently. What I am saying is you're holding off autonomy for a period of evaluation. You're holding off like being independent so I can evaluate, are we really meant to be together? And Paul, again, gives us instruction in 1 Timothy chapter 5. This is actually about church leaders where he says, don't be hasty in laying on hands for church leaders. Like, don't, don't, don't be quick to appoint someone to a position of leadership. You can't be hasty. He says this. He says, some people's sins go before them that you can see right when they're coming in. Not a lot. You can see what they're about. Like, okay. Like, they, their sins go before them. But he says, other sins go behind them, after them. So you actually can't see it coming forward. You got to see it as they walk by and you evaluate like, oh, that's the trail they left. So that's why you cannot be hasty in your relationships, that there's an evaluation as they're coming and as they're walking and you see where them coming in and going out and you're able to discern like, okay, is this, is this the right person? Now, talked about a lot of the who and the how, and I think a lot of you might be thinking like, I don't even do this, right? My gosh. And so here's, here's what sometimes people do, well-intentioned. Sometimes what we do is we go, well, that's not, I don't even do that. I'm not doing that. So we'll lower the standard of our companion in, 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 to, to, to meet the level of what we think we deserve. And what I would say is like, if, if you're hearing this and you're listening to this, I love you and I'm your pastor and I care for you so much and I see the pain, I see the hurt. Listen to me, if you hear the word of God and the conviction is like, I don't even do this, please hear me, then you have no business dating. No business. Don't, don't do it. Because the mistake a lot of people do is they think I'm, I'm, I'm a half person, I just need another half person to make a whole person. I'm just not complete, and I need them to go. No, that's actually a myth, a big myth. You, you're, you're unwhole, and they're unwhole. You're going to come together, and you're not going to get whole in this. You're going to get a mess, a whole lot of mess is what you're going to get. So here's the myth that sometimes we think, and some of you have probably thought this, like, I need to find the right person. I just need to find the right person, Pastor. Just look at, and so we think this, and maybe even say this, and, and the intention may not, but this is like, if I just find the right person, then I'll be happy. Then I'll be well. Then I'll be satisfied. Then I'll be complete. Then I'll be, and it's, and not only like for them, like I just need to find the right person because that person is going to do for me, but uh, there's, I need to find the right person because, because I'll be. So, so like, uh, like your habits will all go away. All your bad habits, if I just find the right person, like it doesn't really matter, like the kind of bad habits you have. All you need is really the right person. It doesn't matter how you spend money right now and your bad debt issues. You just need to find someone who's rich, who can actually take care. I just need to find the right person. I just find the right person who just buy my stuff. And, and, so, and so that's not, that is a, a myth. Like you don't need to, and some of you, it's maybe not even like, everything's external. I need to find the right person. I need to find the right thing. This brings satisfaction and fulfillment. I need the promotion. I need, everything's external. It's like, I just need, I need this. And what if I had this? What if I had that? And you're going through life looking for all these external things that would bring satisfaction or value or worth or fulfillment to you. And little by little, you're realizing it's not that. It's not that. And it's not that. And it's not that. And, and at some point, you get to a place where you're like, then what in the world is it? Well, could it be that we're just believing a myth and chasing a fantasy? And the reality is this, that you really don't need to find the right person. You need to become the right person. That, that there, before the dating process, there's this. There's this process of becoming. Like I believe the, for, the first rule of dating is this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart. Like that's the first rule. Is I'm, gonna, I'm gonna become the right person. I'm gonna become the person, the person I'm looking for is looking for. Did you catch that? Look, following Jesus will help you become the person that the person you're looking for is actually looking for. So I don't need to be so much on the hunt, like Ruth picking grain in the field on the hunt. I can actually focus on becoming who God has called me to be. And, and the person I'm looking for is looking for me. I'm going to become that person. Okay? And maybe for some of you, it's like, if you're married, are you still that person? that they were looking for, still, or did you get complacent? I think, uh, I think I'd like to start right here with maybe not looking for all these other things that is gonna satisfy your life, allowing God to do something inside of you to bring satisfaction and fulfillment, finally, to your life. Not from another person, not from another promotion, not from other things, but from you.
from God giving it to you. Can I pray for you? Every head bowed and every eye closed in here. Online with us as well if you're online. Can we just have a moment of prayer with you? Because you're here today, some of you, and, and maybe you have projected all, every, like you're trying to find something or someone and nothing is doing it. And really what it is is God is waiting to bring you to a place and just waiting for you to, to try, start looking to Him for what you need and instead of all these other things. Offended at other people, people letting you down. Instead of, it's, they weren't supposed to. They weren't supposed to meet all of your expectations. Maybe coming to God today and allowing God to do something inside of you. Maybe that, that's the solution to the fulfillment and the hole that we all have in our hearts about him. With every head bowed and eye closed, if you're here today and you know that that's true, you know like, like the Holy Spirit is revealing that only like he can, then I, I'd love to help you pray a prayer to invite Jesus into your life. I'm not going to have you come up to the front or single you out, but the Bible is very clear that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you shall be saved. Like you can get a fresh start right here, right now. You can start becoming that right person. Let God doing a work inside of you, making you healed and whole and stop looking for other things and people to satisfy you. Like he can give it right to you. He can make you into the right person. Some of you need that today. And I'd love to pray for you. I'm not going to have you come up, but right where you're seated, I'm just going to count to three. And I'd love for you to just lift up your hand and raise it up if you're ready for a fresh start. And online at the count of three, you can type in, I need Jesus, if you're ready. Come on, if you're here today and that's you and you know it, Holy Spirit speaking to you. One, two, three. Lift up your hand right now. I need a fresh start with God. I surrender. I need to surrender. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah, amen, amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Leave it up for me. I want to see you. Come on, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Yep, back there. Thank you, God. All over here. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Back there, too. Uh-huh. Go ahead and put your hands down. Can I help you with a prayer? Say something like this. Say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Today, I surrender the control of my life to you. I'm no longer looking outwardly for fulfillment. I'm looking to you. Jesus, I declare you're my Lord, my Savior. Come live inside of me and make me brand new. Thank you, God, for saving me. God, I speak over every person that's here today that from the, the stages of dating to marriage that we would invite you into this process, that we wouldn't do this without you, that we do this prayerfully, we would do this patiently, that we would do it with purity. God, help us to, to honor you with all of our relationships as you work on us and show us and guide our steps, I pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Come on, give God some praise if you receive that today. Amen.